The Triumph of Short-Termism When our stock owners, especially our giant institutions, focus so heavily on short-term investment horizons, responsible corporate citizenship is among the first victims. While corporate governance issues would seem to demand vital concern on the part of the long-term investor, they lose much, if not all, of their importance for the short-term speculator. Far too large a portion of the investment management industry may be fairly characterized as having a bad case of short-termism. The temperature of the investment patient, as it were, can be measured by his portfolio turnover rate. In equity mutual fund portfolios, for example, the average turnover of stocks leaped from a remarkably stable annual rate of roughly 15% year after year for decades, up to and including the mid-1960s, to 100% or more since the late 1990s. Interest in governance faded accordingly. If that six-year holding period of yore for the average common stock in a fund portfolio marked mutual funds as an own-a-stock industry, surely today's one-year holding period marks the field as a rent-a-stock industry. Why spend money on evaluating a company's governance, for example, when you likely won't even be holding your shares when the next proxy season rolls around. Indeed, given the hyper-short-term trading activity that now characterizes most institutional investing, the apparent reluctance of portfolio managers to speak out on governance issues, however counterproductive, may actually reflect a sort of perverse common sense. Keeping a low profile but there's more than short-termism that accounts for the absence of most financial institutions from the governance scene. Consider that market index funds and other funds that follow essentially static buy-and-hold strategies now hold some 25% of the equities owned by the institutional 100. Such funds typically purchase each stock in the stock market, or in the Standard & Poor's 500 Composite Stock Price Index, the S&P 500, weighting the holdings on the basis of each company's market capitalization. They then hold these stocks, well, forever. Index funds are the quintessential long-term investors. They cannot and they do not follow the old Wall Street rule, if you don't like the management, sell the stock. Their only recourse in responding to corporate problems is to press the company's directors to fix them. Yet even the voices of these consummate long-term investors have been, if not totally silent, at least reduced to a whisper. What's more, even active managers engaging in what passes for low turnover in the current environment, say less than 35% annually, have generally refrained from intrusion into the affairs of the corporations in which they invest. One obvious reason for this passivity is the desire to avoid controversy. In the asset-gathering business that money management has become, a high profile on a divisive issue is more curse than blessing. Managers with reputations as pesky gnats aren't likely to attract many corporate clients. Let sleeping dogs lie seems to be the operative rule among institutional managers. They seem to consider corporate governance issues to be peripheral, unrelated to their quest to generate the highest possible returns. The Wisdom of Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett The short-termism that characterizes the behavior of institutional managers defies the wisdom of some of the sagest investors of the modern age, and the wisdom of an earlier age as well. In the present era, all too few investment managers buy and hold for the long term, and all too many rapidly trade their stocks based on the changing valuations that Mr. Market the metaphorical character created by legendary investor and teacher Benjamin Graham, whom we met in the previous chapter, offers each day. As Graham pointed out, Mr. Market knocks on each investor's door every business day and offers to buy each of his stocks or to sell him more shares at its current price. But succumbing to the wiles of Mr. Market allows the emotions of the moment to take precedence over the economics of the long term, as transitory shifts in prices get investors thinking about the wrong things. In the short run, the stock market is a voting machine, Graham pointed out. In the long run, it is a weighing machine. Graham's view 
was that corporations managed with a view toward enhancing their long-term intrinsic values, gaining extra weight, if you will, would prove to be better investments than those focused on building short-term stock prices by engineering quarterly earnings with a view toward gaining extra votes. His simple metaphor works out in practice. The record is clear that fund managers who hold companies for the long term and allow intrinsic value to build over time have provided higher returns to their clients than managers that hold stocks for the short term and trade them whenever Mr. Market offers a tempting but momentary price. Berkshire Hathaway's equally legendary investor, Warren Buffett, Benjamin Graham's protege, is among the most pristine of corporate managers. As an investor who runs Berkshire's $38 billion equity portfolio of publicly traded stocks, he is attuned not to the vote of the short term, but to the weight of the long term. He describes his favorite holding period as forever, with long-term returns that have exceeded by a wide margin the returns achieved by even the most successful other major investment organizations, his results speak for themselves. What is more, his philosophy as a money manager is in lockstep with his philosophy as a corporate manager. Buffett's firm is publicly held, and he regularly hammers home to his shareholders the message that he prefers Berkshire stock to trade at or around its intrinsic value, neither materially higher nor lower. He explains that intrinsic value is the discounted value of the cash that can be taken out of the business during its remaining life. When the stock temporarily overperforms or underperforms the business, a limited number of shareholders, either sellers or buyers, receive outsized benefits at the expense of those they trade with. But over time, the aggregate gains made by Berkshire shareholders must of necessity match the business gains of the company. What a refreshing perspective from one who knows what's important in investing.